on the slide. Okay, so hello everybody, welcome. This is a discussion of um, close um, reading skills. It's part of the continuing professional development program at the University of Glasgow. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Stacey. As Katie said, I am a lecturer in English literature and I'm also the widening participation officer um, for our division, which is the School of Critical Studies. I also convene our large first year module, 1A Poetry and Poetics, which is taught to over 420 students each September. It's the first literature module they encounter at university and it's the largest module in the School of Critical Studies, if not the College of Arts. Um, I'm also in another strand of my career, I'm quite heavily involved in Key Stage 5 uh, provision in England for GCSE English Literature and I was on a small committee um, of people which designed uh, the most recent A-level syllabus for English Literature with OCR. So in this session I'm going to be discussing ways in which we might be able to help students critically engage with literary texts. I'm going to be focusing on um, primarily on one poem. It's a beautiful piece, which tends to be set for key stage four or key stage five. Um, some of you may know it. It's titled Letters from Yorkshire by um, Maura Dooley. Now, I'm going to be exploring um, the poem through the steer of several keywords. These are words which are cited in the course specification for Hires English by SQA and they focus on the component titled Reading for Understanding, Analysis and Evaluation. Now I've uh, cherry-picked a few of the, the keywords from the spe specification here, I've not cut and pasted, um, but you can you can see that the kind of steers that, that the exam board give teachers as part of their um, um, kind of practice in order to enable the, the, the material to be assessed. Um, but there are three words that I'm going to be particularly focusing on today in this presentation. And these words are understanding, analysis and evaluation. And I've chosen these words because they're words that um, bridge the gap. They provide a really nice overlap um, between some of the, the things I tend to do in relation to Key Stage 5 and A-level in a school-based context, and then the kind of pedagogy that um, I practice with first-year students coming to university for the first time. So here is the uh, poem, Letters from Yorkshire. Um, as I said earlier, some of you may be familiar with it. It's quite well known. Um, I am going to read it out. Um, because I'll be discussing different um, linguistic features within the poem. So it'd be quite good, I think, to get a handle on it. Um, and also personally, I'm quite keen to promote the value and the sheer artistry of um, poetry um, when it's increasingly um, in uh, an increasingly insecure feature of educational syllabi. So I'll just read this out now. Letters from Yorkshire by Maura Dooley. In February, digging his garden, planting potatoes, he saw the first lapwings return and came indoors to write to me, his knuckles singing as they reddened in the warmth. It's not romance, simply how things are. You out there in the cold, seeing the seasons turning, me with my heart full of headlines, feeding words into a blank screen. Is your life more real because you dig and sow? You wouldn't say so, breaking ice on a water butt, clearing a path through snow. Still, it's you who sends me word of that other world, pouring air and light into an envelope. So that at night, watching the same news in different houses, our souls tap out messages across the icy miles. Absolutely amazing piece of work. So our first word is understanding. This is the word obviously promoted quite early on by SQA and it's a word um, I think all of us are, would be quite keen for our students to get to grips with. Um, understanding is almost a base skill it seems to me. It's a word which ascertains whether the student has understood the core meaning of the text, its subject matter. 
Now, in my experience, I don't know if, if, if anybody agrees with this, sometimes when students are approaching uh, poems for the first time, they tend to adopt a, a top-down approach um, with a, or almost with a preconceived idea of the poem, which is imposed or stamped onto the language on the page. I think my instinct is this word understanding is asking the student to flip this idea or this assumption on its head to start with words and syntax and make sure that they're building their initial meaning from these tiny uh, building blocks. So I am um, I'm going to be discussing some possible strategies that you might find useful and um, these are strategies that um, we tend to use on 1A Poetry and Poetics with our first years who um, come to us uh, straight from school. I did have some students who were, were guinea pigs so I'm just going to be discussing the strategies based around these keywords now and then give you a sense of, of, of what, what our, our first years came up with who were only a few, a few weeks in, into their degree programme. So the, the first thing I uh, do with students on, on one approach in poetics, especially if they find the language really inscrutable, is ask them to define a poem as a playlet, as a miniature drama with characters and a kind of plot or a storyline. I found that this is a great way of utilising some of the skills which students will have acquired from other literary forms, such as uh, prose and drama, whilst helping them to move past the feature of poetry, which seems most intimidating at first, the, the, the perceived obscurity of literary language. Now, I would always start with the main character who is the speaker. It's familiar to everybody watching this that the um, speaker is a voice or a kind of persona, um, a ventriloquized entity that's composed of words. Um, however, um, we all know that, that, that many students do have a habit of associating the speaker with the poet themselves, seeing the I as a kind of com confessional key. Um, on one, one A Poetry and Poetics, this happens all the time. It's something that, that we're quite keen to get, engage with in terms of understanding. Um, and um, it happens f for all kinds of poets, especially Robert Browning, who is the king of the dramatic monologue. I think for many of our first years, they find him to be sometimes a confessional poet, a bit like Sylvia Plath. Um, so one way in which I think you can help students to think about understanding is through the use of pronouns. So I have my students, I kind of put the poem in front of them, sat them down and tried to get them think about who is inhabiting these poems, which characters are entities through the use of pronouns. And you can see there are some color coded pronouns here, um, two primary colors and then a, a, a third one um, near the end. So if you do, if you use kind of highlighted pronouns as a route into understanding, characters emerge quite quite quickly. And you can see here straight away, there are two characters. One seems to be maybe a farmer, certainly somebody who's associated with rural life. Um, the other is more home-based, typing at a laptop. And then other kind of contrasts start to emerge. So one, one is outside and, and the other is um, inside. The next thing I'd do as this route into understanding this kind of key, key word um, would be to ask the students, now they've got a, a grip of, of, of the characters in the poem, to see how they move through the world which is being uh, fashioned by the poem, how they're animated by the poet, what happens to them. And I think this is the second feature of that primary initial understanding, a grasp of the situation of the represented figures what maybe amounts to a, to a tiny plot. So again, when, when I kind of spoke to my students about this and, and use pronouns as a, as a steer, start particular types of action or, be, or behavior start to emerge in, in relation to the colors. So we can see that one character is attempting to communicate the wonders of a rural uh, winter landscape to a speaker. They're both apart in different houses essentially in, 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 in different worlds. And they're both using language, words, typing, letters, um, forms of, of kind of linguistic interaction to communicate um, with, with, with each other. And then we can also see at the end with purple that these pronouns shift, they modulate. So they start with he, then we find the word you, a kind of more intimate um, form of address. And then in the last um, stanza, they become our, a kind of plural. So the pronouns, I think, really seem to help students map their 
story and the characters onto the poem and it really helps them to kind of break the back of understanding understanding exactly what 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 the poem is about and avoiding this kind of top top down approach so that that's one strategy that I, we, we tend to use on 1a poetry and poetics with, with, with our first years my second keyword is analysis the um this is a, a critical steer which has been included by um S sqa in their material on close reading skills um to my understanding obviously it's a very kind of broad broad and in some ways quite a loose uh, term in my understanding um analysis is the ex uh, exploration of effect the meanings which are produced on the page by the use of language um words and images now, as everybody watching this knows, effects are really difficult for a lot of students to grasp. As um, convener of our poetry module, it's the single most common piece of feedback we give to the first years. Um, However, it is one of these primary critical steers which are offered by SQA in the prospectus. And in some ways, um, analysis is the richest, most exciting part of literary engagement. It's the identification of the lexical traces and ingenuities which can cultivate themes and um, concepts. I also think if analysis is predicated on evidence, which, which, which it tends to be in, in literary studies, I think there are also some really nice transferable skills here. Um, in relation to evidence, as I've said, but also objective reasoning. Um, and in, as part of my practice, I'm always amazed at how similar the the, the analysis of, of literary evidence can be to something like science, where you maybe start with a reading, an intuition, a sense of understanding, and then work back to a source, gathering specific evidence, which will prove whether your reading, your meaning, your uh, theory is cohesive or persuasive. So with the students, when we're beginning to embark on analysis, the analysis of effects, um, I always ask the students to identify specific pieces of evidence, textual evidence, which coalesce around character, which have been used effectively to shape these characters, these kind of rep represented entities in the text. Um, I also stress here that the analysis of a text will be much sharper if uh, the students engage with um, these represented figures as textual constructs rather than real people with um, private thoughts and feelings, constructs which are designed to, to generate effects. If you kind of put that idea in, in place in, in a kind of classroom or, or seminar based environment, I think that's that's half of the job done, that, that a kind of character is a, almost as a meaning making entity in a sense. Um, so once our students have gathered um, any text, primary textual evidence which coalesces around character and story, um, they can start wondering which specific effects are generated through um, metaphor, language and words. And they're very likely, or in my case, students are very likely to start identifying image chains. So they'll see that, that certain images that tend to be associated with certain actions or particular metaphors or similes coalesce around um, particular characters. So um, when, when, I, when I'm beginning to think about analysis and effects, I ask them to think about the evidence associated with character and how that's essentially or effectively transformed in, into a metaphor. And I think once you've done this, you're in a really good position to start engaging with literary analysis. Um, so throughout the poem, um, we can see throughout Letters of Yorkshire, Dooley uses it seems to me two particular image chains. One, one is focused on ice, the weather, this kind of wintry landscape, breaking ice on a, a water boat, clearing a path through the snow across the icy mile. You out there in the cold, that's one image chain and that seems to coalesce around, I guess, one of these characters, the um, the, the he, the, the, the male lover almost. And, and another image chain is writing and language. So head, we get words such as headlines, feeding words, word of that other world, envelope, news, 
tap out messages almost like a, a kind of either tapping at a keyboard or even in an older discourse a, a, a kind of telegram so um once the um students have cultivated a degree of evidence they um and this evidence is is helping them to understand the poem and embark upon analysis um I start to ask, we, we ask them to think about why that evidence is, is significant. And there are several, um, several phrases that I, I tend to use. I'll just uh, go back again. So you, you probably use this in your teaching practice. There are analytical words. If um, a student has identified that ice imagery is recurrent throughout the poem, the, the, the question is next why what what is the, what what are the effects generated by ice imagery and one one way in which i tell the students to shape their um words and their response through analytical verbs so this suggests or this implies that's a way in which the understanding of the poem can be harnessed and, and moved towards a form of an a form of analysis so i use my students as guinea pigs i asked them to discuss some of the effects of these image chains that they identified, the idea of ice imagery, the snow imagery that runs through the poem, and then also this kind of typing imagery or this language imagery. And the, these are the type of things that the students came up with. What's the effect of ice imagery? They thought that it contrasted with the growing warmth of an emotional human connection. And it even um, presages this implied connection through images of thawing, the idea of ice kind of slowly melting and the evidence there was his knuckles singing as they reddened in the warmth there's a lo lovely image there and another effect of the ice imagery our first years identified was that they felt it established a contrast between two different types of struggle one rural and one defined by modern pressures so the ice imagery of the outdoor world was contrasted they felt with a more kind of safe indoor dom dom domestic space um, when I asked the students to think about some of the analytical effects which were produced by this other strain of imagery, typing imagery, here is what our students came up with. Um, they felt that the images used by um, Dule um, were an attempt to the level of metaphor to traverse distance in space. So our souls tap out messages across the icy miles. That was a really lovely sense of effect, a sense of analysis the, the, the students came up with there. And then also um, language, they felt language in the poem can recreate and even reform the outside world. And the evidence they highlighted was, sends me word of that other world pouring air and light into an envelope. So there's some, um, there, 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 there are some approaches that we tend to adopt in relation to analysis, this skill that AQA are asking, um, SQA, sorry, are asking um, te teachers to en engage with. And that's how we, we, we approach this on one a poetry and poetics. So our third keyword that I'm going to be focusing on is evaluation. Um, Evaluation is quite a tricky critical skill to master. A bit like analysis, our students tend to um, find difficulty with this and it's very challenging to get, get to grips with, probably more so than, than the other two words. I would define evaluation as the attempt to consider why all of the prior information which has been gathered as part of a, a close reading of a poem such as, for example, the understanding of the poem, including its characters and events, and the analysis of the meanings generated by literary language, the analysis of effects. Um, evaluation is the attempt to consider why this is significant. Why is all of this detail important or relevant or even interesting? This challenge is effectively asking students to sum up the cumulative achievement of the ideas, themes or techniques which are present throughout the text. So in my teaching, the most useful word for the analysis of literary language, the, the evaluation of 
um, meaning in, in, a, in, a, in a poem is why. Why is a bird image used when Emily Dickinson, uh, Emily Bronte's poetic speaker is looking out of the bars of a prism? Uh, why does great expectations open in a graveyard um, with death and the, the somber spectres of the past? Um, why, if you ask the students why and they can come up with one, two or maybe three answers, they tend to be evaluating the wider significance of the poem, the, the poem or the text and its meaning. When a poem has been understood and we have a fairly cogent understanding of the uh, conceptual effects generated by imagery in a seminar space, I asked the students to do uh, two things. One, with all of their analysis of effects, I asked them to extrapolate a possible theme or a concept based on the evidence. And then I asked them to answer the question, why? with a caveat that there is no one correct answer, only an evaluation of the possible significance of the idea being articulated in the wider text. And there are some phrases predicated on evaluative verbs that I ask my students to think about and incorporate as part of their um, academic writing skills. So I've often found that these phrases tend, tend to work quite well with, with first year students when they're beginning to evaluate poetry. Through the use of dot, 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 duly signifies that dot, dot, dot. That um, latter phrase signifies that. It encourages a student to use an evaluative verb and start to wonder why all of these effects have broader meaning in terms of interpretation. And then another phrase I've, I've found to be really effective is a, a, a comparative phrase, just as dot, 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 usually referring to a particular image, so do they. And then that tends to be followed by a verb, which would be regarded as evaluative. So duly celebrates or subverts or criticizes or draws attention to. So coming up to the near the end of my presentation now, I asked the students to start to think about how they would evaluate some of the um, close readings and their initial or primary understandings about the poem. Um, I put them in small groups and asked them again to un underline a particular theme or a, a concept that they found interesting. The students were really interested in language and the idea that words, this transmission of text seems to not just be, be a metaphor that can generate effects, effects, it's a bit richer than this and more expansive. It's akin to a theme. It's, it's a key that can provide meaning to the poem in, in totality. So I asked them to do this. I gave them, um, I'll just go back on my slide. I gave them some of these sentence structures that they might find very effective as an inroad into evaluation. They underlined these quotes and these are the kind of sentences that they came up with. Why is textual imagery significant within the poem? How would you evaluate the meaning of this? They said things like, through the use of textual imagery, duly signifies the importance of words and writing in maintaining human closeness. There's a really nice evaluative verb there in the word signifies. Then just as the represented landscape is put into the letter by the lover as part of their description of the thawing winter world, as suggested by the verb pouring, duly uses the text of her poem to effect a reply. So the, the, that's, that was a really nice point they came up with there that the, the speaker inside the poem has received a letter and the poem we are reading in our hands is in effect the speaker's reply. The poem becomes a, a, a kind of letter involved in a, in a call and response. Thought that was um, a nifty bit of evaluation by our, our first years there that provided a, a good sense of uh, meaning. And thus throughout letters from Yorkshire, Dooley celebrates the value of communication between humans who are far apart, who inhabit the other world. So that verb celebrates there is a really lovely evaluative word that um, allows the, the student to let you know that they've got a grasp on the, the, the wider uh, significance of the text. So that's the end of um, my presentation. Um, I've tried to use these steers, these critical keywords in SQA to establish overlaps between 
um, some of the things I, I do in um, my A-level career in Key Stage 5, and then the type of teaching we practice here at the University of Glasgow in our literature seminar rooms with our first years. I hope you've um, found this useful. I'm going to minimise these slides. We can stop the recording and then maybe begin a Q&A session.